Right. Um, I think I'll, I'll sort of start off now and, and really uh, from me to you, welcome uh, to the annual International Property Lecture uh, enabled by the Herschel Smith Fund. Um, and if I've got my maths right, this is our 17th uh, one of these sort of annual lectures to go through. There's clearly a bit of a COVID interregnum, um, but we're, we're back firmly on track. Now, most of you, this is my memory from last year, um, by being in this room, will either have a deep knowledge of this area or a very detailed curiosity of it from an associated field. I have neither, um, but I have found this area increasingly important as I try to make sense of the emerging ecosystem of research innovation that spins around Cambridge itself. Uh, but in many ways, actually, it's also helping me in another lens uh, to look at how the whole makeup of the world and the systems that are with us and are changing on a daily basis um, work. Tonight, uh, we have a genuine treat, if I may say, in advance. Uh, Professor Owen Baraka is one of the most impressive scholars in the world of intellectual property law. Uh, he is multi-talented. He's a legal analyst who ranks with the best, a political philosopher who grapples with tricky questions surrounding the theoretical justifications for intellectual property rights, as well as being the leading historian of intellectual property law in the US. That's quite a lot of, of multi-talents all coming together in that interdisciplinary mix. Oren is the William C. Connor Chair in Law at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, it's a wonderful place. I had two wonderful years of my life uh, there a while back. And if you ever have a chance to go and see Austin as a city, for me, it don't, it, it's different to anywhere else inside of Texas. The city's music, uh, dining scene, coupled with one of the best rowing lakes I've ever had a chance to row on, uh, really is quite special. Uh, before moving to Texas, Oren did both his LLM and his doctoral studies, a doctor in judicial science, at the Harvard Law School. Oren's skill as a doctrinal scholar and policy thinker is displayed in numerous articles in law reviews and edited volumes. Perhaps of most interest to those uh, here is the as yet unpublished article, The Work of Copyright in the Age of Machine Production. This is a powerful and persuasive analysis of the relationship between copyright and artificial intelligence, a topic obviously very much in vogue as we were just talking about uh, just now. Uh, in terms of his theoretical contributions to the field, one might mention a couple of his many law review articles. First, in Give Us Back Our Tragedy, he reiterates the fundamental importance of recognizing the non rivalrous characteristic of information goods, that is, that use by one person does not prevent or impede the use by another. Moreover, in his work with Tyler Syed of Berkeley, he provides a groundbreaking analysis of the relationship between an emerging group of consequent sensitive theories of copyright, those that emphasize, for example, its importance for democracy or fair distribution, and more conventional consequentialist theories. You can see what I mean now about trying to understand the changing world uh, that we live in. But Oren is most widely recognized as a legal historian with a particular focus on intellectual property, especially of the 19th century. His book, Owning Ideas, the Intellectual Origins of American Intellectual Property, 1790 to 1909, is, by looking at the reviews, a masterpiece. It's an intellectual history exploring the legal and conceptual transformations as key features of the laws of patent and copyright law that took place in the long 19th century. The book reflects an enormous amount of research, is elegantly constructed and full of analytical insights. And again, I don't know this area deeply, but I did have a little bit of a Google on the reviews. It is clearly brilliant and a classic, and there is uh, many of the reviews say there is nothing close that comes to it. This evening, Oren is going to explore the topic of physicalism in intellectual property. And I expect we're going to see many of the bits I've just described woven together and transparent into it. Oren will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for, I think, for a session of Q&A, which we'll do our best to moderate. Oren, thank you. Thank you very much, Master, for this clearly over-generous introduction. Uh, I absolutely have to disclaim a few of the titles, but I don't want to spend time on that. Uh, what I do want to say that it is a real genuine pleasure to be here for many reasons. I'll only mention two. The first one is that many years ago, when I had considerably more hair, um, 
I actually spent a very short uh, exchange student time here in Cambridge in a, in a college that shall not be named. And I liked it a lot, so that's one reason. And the other reason I'll mention is I'm just a big fan of English peculiarities, I, I suppose, and this place seems to provide them in abundance, so that's very nice. So thank you, Professor Lionel Bentley. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Emmanuel College. Thank you, everybody else whom I should be thanking. Okay, as advertised, my talk this evening is going to be about physicalism in intellectual property. Specifically, I will be arguing that despite the fact that we, as in virtually everybody in this field, despite the fact that we've accepted long ago as sort of a basic truism of the field, that the field is about property in intangible objects, it's called intellectual property after all, despite that, we keep lapsing time and again into physicalist assumptions and modes of thinking in this field. And I'll be arguing that that has significant implications. I will try to diagnose that issue. I will venture to explain it. And finally, I will do my best to prescribe perhaps some remedies to Okay, so I think a good place to start. Oh, there's one more caveat actually before I really start. The caveat is as follows. I'm going to speak mainly about American cases and American legal doctrines because that's what I know best. Please do not assume that that means that what I'm going to tell you is a story about those ignorant and uncouth people across the Atlantic who don't know better. No, the symptoms that I'm going to talk about, I'm very much sure are quite present on this side of the Atlantic and indeed across the channel, and I would wager globally. So let's put that assumption off the table. Okay, now I can really start, and a good place to start would be the big intellectual property cases of the late 18th century in England, actually. Why? because this is the formative moment of intellectual property. At least conceptually, this is the moment that intellectual property really becomes intellectual property. So listen to the following. Let's start with Mansfield. Of course, we have to start with Mansfield. From one of the great literary property cases of the 18th century, Miller versus Taylor. And Mansfield is describing literary property as follows. It is incorporeal. It relates to ideas detached from any physical existence. And now fast forward to 1795, Chief Justice Eyre, in the great case of Bolton and Watt versus Bull. This is the great case of method patents. And uh, Eyre is quoted in Mansfield, of course, when he says, it, meaning the patent, must be for the method detached from all physical existence, whatever. And Eyre is doing it while his brethren, justices, all in one way or another, are still held in the thralls of some physicalist assumptions, so they all deny the possibility, the very possibility, of something like a method that, exactly because it's non-physical. Okay, now, those observations by both Mansfield and Eyre at their time were really, truly path-breaking. But in our times, they're really taken for granted truisms of the field. We all understand that intellectual property is about property in intangibles. That's what puts the I in IP, right? We all explain that to our students on day one. This class is about property in intangibles. There is no question about it. So I could have stopped here and we could go to DNR and have fun, but I'm afraid that the story only begins and the plot is about to take an ominous turn. And that is going to happen with three. I will be using only three 
examples of physicalist fallacies, again, taken from rather notable American cases, at least the first two. The third one is still ongoing. So let me start first with a case which is called molecular pathology versus myriad genetics. This is a very important American case from 2013, a case in which the U.S. Supreme Court, after a very long period of lax treatment of DNA patents, reconsiders the subject or patents for isolated DNA sequences. Specifically, the Supreme Court in that case considered patents for two um, genes associated or mutations of which are associated with breast cancer, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. That, that was the specific issue. But again, the bigger issue was the patentability of isolated gene sequences that for a long time in the United States were accepted as patentable. Let me say the following. First of all, the name was already mentioned, but I completely have to give credit here to my uh, very good friend and brilliant colleague, Tala Syed, Professor Tala Syed at Berkeley Law School, because my discussion of this particular case draws heavily on his work. Okay, so here's the basic ruling by the Supreme Court in Miri. Supreme Court ruled that naturally occurring DNA sequences are unpatentable because they are the product of nature or they are natural phenomena. This is one of the three unpatentable unpatent categories of subject matter under American law. On the other hand, the court rule, cDNA sequences, so let me explain quickly, cDNA is synthetic DNA. cDNA is sequences of genes which are created in the lab Informationally, they're completely equivalent to naturally occurring DNA, but because they're made using messenger RNA molecules, their chemical structure is somewhat different. They don't have the inert regions of naturally occurring DNA. So with respect to cDNA, which informationally functionally is completely equivalent to naturally occurring gene sequences, the Supreme Court ruled that this is unpatentable subject matter. So that's the basic distinction in the case. Now, I hope that the name of the doctrine, the name of the legal exclusion for patentability I've already mentioned, product of nature or natural phenomena, or already gave you pause. It should have caused warning lights to go. I'm talking about physical as if after. But now consider in a bit more detail the reasoning of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, explaining its first ruling, said, Miriam did, Myriad, sorry, did not create anything, but he is attempting to patent an important and useful gene it found. Products of nature are not created, and manifestations of nature are free to all men and reserved exclusive, exclusively to none. In short, inventions are ma man-made. Patenting natural phenomenon is patenting nature, which is not made. While cDNA, on the other hand, is not naturally occurring. And therefore, quote from the court, cDNA is not the product of nature and is patent eligible because the lab technician unquestionably creates something new when cDNA is made. So that's the reasoning of the case. The reasoning might seem self-evident to you. But I would argue it only seems self-evident because there is a smuggled in physicalist assumption within it, as follows. To see the physicalist assumption, let's engage in a very simple exercise. Take DNA patents, take cDNA patents, and add at the beginning of each of them knowledge of to designate the intangible object of property. So now this is what the patents are for. And once we engage in that exercise, the distinction and the reasoning of the quote should dissipate like a fog. Because once we say that the patent is for knowledge all, then 
in neither case, neither in the case of naturally occurring DNA, nor the case of cDNA, the patent is really for anything that occurs in nature. Nobody lifts the physical DNA from nature, which is not man-made, and tries to patent it. The patent is always for knowledge of, and that is equally true in the case of DNA and cDNA. Patent claims are never for the product of nature. And hence the clarifying effect of simply adding knowledge of before the claim. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to argue that gene sequences should be patentable because of what I've just said. What I am trying to argue is that the distinction of the code between DNA and cDNA basically completely rides on a hidden physicalist assumption that the patent is really for the DNA as such. Once, once that assumption is taken away, as it should, the distinction and therefore the reasoning disappears. Personally, for reasons I may explain later, I think that both cDNA and DNA shouldn't be patentable. But again, once the distinction is taken away, the reasoning disappears, leaving the opinion, with all due respect, with a justificatory vacuum. Exhibit 2. Exhibit 2 is the seminal case of Feist versus Rural. This is a copyright case from 1991. It is the great case in which the modern American Supreme Court basically revives what is called originality doctrine. In copyright, the requirement that the work must be original and specifically created in order to be eligible for copyright. More specifically, in that case, the court discusses the copyrightability of what copyright lawyers in the U.S. like to call compilations. Compilations are works which are made of smaller elements. And the court discusses the possibility that even though the smaller elements compiled into a work might not be copyrightable, the compilation itself may be copyrightable. So that's what the case is known for, as well as other things. I want us to focus on one, only one, but quite important part of the case. And that is the case where the court explains why facts in themselves are uncopyrightable. I should have said it before, and the actual facts of the case involve a white pages telephone directory. Remember those, the actual white pages telephone directory? The basic finding of the court is the factual entries, the mere factual information per subscriber, even though uh, the plaintiff might have invested labor and investment in producing it, is not copyrightable. Why? Because it's facts. And why aren't facts copyrightable? Well, listen to the Supreme Court. Quote, No one may claim originality as to facts. This is because facts do not owe their origin to an act of authorship. The distinction is one between creation and discovery. The first person who finds and reports a particular fact has not created the fact. He or she has merely discovered its existence. One who discovers a fact is not a maker or originator. Again, what could be truer than that? Until we consider the, in this case, I will call it quasi-physicalist fallacy in this reasoning. In fact, I, I don't think you can find a more beautiful and precise specimen of quasi-physicalist fallacy. So by quasi-physicalist, I mean in this case, clearly, the court does not assume that there's something physical out there in the world that is being copyrighted, right? Fact is a piece of information, right? So it's not literal physicalism. But the court, with its reasoning, clearly treats the factual information as an entity out there in the world, like a physical object that is being plucked, taken from the world, and then claimed something pre-existing in the natural world that is being taken and claimed by the copyright. That's what I mean by quasi-physicalist, as if it is a physical object. 
And again, this quasi-physicalist assumption is exposed and I think dissipates. If we take intangibility seriously in this context, why is that? Well, because facts like any other information is never just out there in nature. At least, again, remember our favorite exercise, if we had knowledge of facts, which is what copyright law cares about, the human knowledge of facts. The human knowledge of facts is not created by nature. It's always man-made. And again, I'm not trying to argue at all that because of that, facts should be copyrightable. I'm arguing that once we expose the physicalist assumption, the reasoning collapses, leaving the opinion with the justificatory vacuum. Third case, and I promise this will be my last exhibit. The third case is actually not a court decision. This is an ongoing set of disputes that are right now making their way in the U.S. through the lower courts. And indeed, I'm sure you, you are already and you will be hearing from those from your own version of those cases here as well. I'm referring, of course, to the generative AI copyright disputes and the many issues that arise in that context. Cases in which generative AI in the cultural expressive field, you know, AI that produces images and texts and videos and pretty soon any kind of expression that you can imagine, um, various legal claims that are brought by copyright owners with respect to entities who train and produce such artificial intelligence systems. Now, just so we can wrap our heads around the issue, let me say the following. Generative AI basically involves two processes of transforming information. Indeed, if you ever had to explain generative AI to somebody without going into the technological mumbo jumbo, Use this one. It works beautifully. It's a system which involves two transformations of information. The first transformation is from concrete informational works. Often those might be or likely to be copyrighted works, a set of images or texts, for example, into meta information. In fact, aggregate meta information about the set of those works. Meta information is information about information in this particular case, it's information about the patterns and relations of expression in those specific works and in between those specific works. That's basically creating the model in AI. So that's the first transformation. The second transformation, which makes generative AI generative, is then taking the meta information and using it to generate new and often and let's just assume that's the case for our purposes, completely different discrete work, different texts, different images. That's the power of generative AI. Yeah, that's what makes it generative. So that's a generative AI system. And what's going on in the lawsuits right now, last time I counted in the US, there are 16 of them, but I'm not sure they keep piling up by the day, is that Copyright owners of different kinds basically throw at various entities involved in producing AI every copyright infringement argument they can find. Every copyright infringement argument you can imagine, and I'm sure some you cannot imagine. But I want to focus just about one but important set of arguments. This is the ar arguments that go to the so-called training copies. What are training copies? I've already told you, to create a model, to extract the meta information, which is crucial for the system, you need to have a data set of works, which are likely to be copyrighted. The purpose of the process is to extract the meta information, which is unprotectable by copyright. Almost nobody disputes that. But it so happens that in order to do that, in order to extract the meta information, you simply have to make full digital copies of those works. That's how it works. At least the technology we have right now, that's how it works. That's how machine, machines learn by extracting meta information. You have to make literal verbatim copies of those works. But again, at least for our purposes, assume with me 
No human will ever experience the world from those copies. It's part of the process of extracting the meta information in order to create the model. Now, one central argument in those cases is the training copies constitute copyright infringement. And note, let's be very clear. The argument in its purest form is no matter what happens next. So it doesn't matter if no human ever experiences the copyrighted work from those digital copies. No matter, indeed, if the generative AI system never generates any similar expression to works in the training set. Indeed, no matter if the AI system doesn't generate any expression, indeed, it doesn't matter if you throw the whole thing into a ditch after you create it, the training copies. It's copyright infringement. How so? Well, obviously, a copy is a copy is a copy, right? And when copyright lawyers say a copy, they mean the physical object, right? So the argument is, again, very simple. What is being made is additional physical objects that contain the exact patterns of the protected copyrighted work. That has to be infringing reproduction if anything, period. Everybody agrees to that, or almost everybody, I should say. Indeed, there's a strong line of precedence going all the way back, not with AI, but similar structure cases, in the US to the early 90s, that basically says when you have non-expressive copies like that, it has to be, at least presumptively, prima facie, as lawyers like to say, copyright infringement for reasons just described. It's the physical embodiment of the work. And then in the US, the debate ensues. Now, if you know anything about copyright law in the US, you already know what the debate is about. It's about fair use, right? Because sooner or later, usually sooner, everything turns into fair use questions in American copyright. We have one camp that says, Yes, making the training copies is presumptively infringing, but there is this firm line of precedence going all the way back to, to the 90s and then through the Google Books cases from the 2010s that says that non-expressive copies like that, again, copies where no human will experience the expression from the work are fair use. And this is just an equivalent case. So it's fair use. And there's a different camp that tries to distinguish both the precedents and the underlying policies. That's the terrain of the debate in the United States. Now, here's what I have to say about it. This debate is completely misguided. Don't tell the US people that I said that. They really don't like it when they hear me saying that because that's what they're invested in. I do think that conceptually the debate is completely misguided. Although if you want a prediction, yes, this issue will be decided in the US on fair use grounds. Conceptually, I think it's misguided for the following reason. I think once you wrap your head around the intangible object of property in copyright, you should understand that non-expressive copies are simply not within the domain of copyright on a very basic level. Why? Because the domain of copyright is not, not just information, but rather expression or expressive forms, if you will. And copyright is only relevant when there is some human access to the expression qua expression, some human enjoyment of that expression. Physical actions and objects are only relevant to that extent in copyright because copyright is not about physical actions and objects as such. And of course, at this point, the objection is, but the copy, there's an identical physical copy. How can you say that that is not a reproduction? And my reaction is, this is exactly physicalism in action. No, the physical action as such does not involve the relevant subject matter of copyright. 
it is not even it is not more relevant for copyright purposes than using a book as a doorstop, for example, or for scratching your head. Now, I understand that this argument is challenging and tricky, so let me try, I hope, I'm not sure, but to make it a bit easier with a small parable. Consider the following parable. An airplane flies over a remote region. The people living in that region are very nice, but unfortunately, they've never been exposed to CD players. They don't have CD players. Now, the airplane happens to be carrying a lot of music CDs and a machine for duplicating those CDs. It crashes in that region. Our nice people who don't have CD players and never will, by stipulation, find a machine and duplicate a lot of music CDs. Why do they do that? You ask yourselves. Well, they like them as shiny objects to decorate their houses. Can we say that their actions have anything to do with the expressive music on the CDs? I think that the moment of thought would tell us, no, there's nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's a physical action that has nothing to do with the expression on those CDs. What is the moral of this story, of this parable? It is again, copyright is, a, is not about mere physical objects or fact or action. It is only about physical actions or objects that involve some sort of connection to the dynamics of producing and consuming, using expressive works. Those are the only physical actions and objects which are relevant for copyright. As Professor Abraham Driesenauer nicely puts it in his own book on copyright, and I quote, the proper subject matter of copyright is expression, not stains of ink on paper. And again, the only reason that the copy is a copy argument in this context seems so compelling is because we make the physicalist fallacy. In this case, the fallacy that assuming that mere physical objects and actions are relevant for copyright. Once we move this, once we remove this fallacy, here I would actually argue the results are different. The legal results are different. I think that uh, the whole case should be analyzed not as a fair use case. Fair use is a defense under American law. It's a sort of a back-end exemption once infringement is already assumed. It should be analyzed under the proper principles of copyrightable subject matter. And the case should be rejected as having nothing to do with copyright at that front gate of subject matter rather than the back end, fair use defense. Okay, I could go on actually, I won't, don't worry, but I could go on with many more examples of physicalism like that in intellectual property. In the United States, to those of you who know something about it, uh, some examples would be the 90s and very much ongoing uh, issue of computer RAM copies, or rather the, the backup, I would say, of computer RAM copies. Um, digital first sale, what you would probably call exhaustion, fiasco. The patent, some patent inherency doctrine puzzled. I'm not stopping to explain any of that. And indeed, enduring suspicion towards method patents. We haven't really shaken, shaken it off completely from the days of Ayer and his brethren. We still are quite suspicious of method patents, exactly because they seem less physical. And as I told you, there are equivalent, very much equivalent issues in the UK and in Europe. So just to mention a few, uh, a software patentability test that reads, thank you for that one, Patrick Gould, that reads as follows. Uh, the question, is whether the claimed subject matter has the character of a concrete apparatus in the sense of a physical entity man-made for, for, for a utilitarian purpose and whether it incorporates physical features. Still in Europe, its own version of the computer RAM copies debacle, and still in Europe, Obviously, equally burning questions about AI copyright infringement, although 
in Europe and I think in the UK as well, this is more likely to be played out through statutory exemptions and perhaps new rights that are being debated, but many of the questions substantively will be similar. And so on and so forth. The list is long, actually. Okay, so what is going on here? What is going on here, I would argue, is that the rumors of the death of physicalism and intellectual property were much exaggerated. In fact, physicalism endured, and it keeps coming back to haunt us. And usually, as I try to demonstrate, that happens through subterranean, concealed or unspoken assumptions that then make the surface reasoning seem ironclad, compelling, unsaleable. But it's only because of those subterranean physicalist assumptions. In fact, we've seen three kinds of physicalist assumptions in intellectual property. In Myriad, we saw perhaps the most classic kind, which is owning nature, right? The assumption that patents, gene patents, are really about owning the gene sequences as such, because that's the only assumption that can support the distinction and the reasoning of the quote. It's distinction between DNA and cDNA. And that particular fallacy of owning a physical object is, of course, the exact fallacy that the brethren of air in Bolton and Watt were subscribing to. That's why they couldn't accept the idea of a method. They had to have something physical there. And in Feist, we saw a slightly different variant of this fallacy. This time, it's not about owning a physical object. Everybody agrees that facts are not physical, but it's about, as I said, quasi-physicalism. It's about taking an informational object, treating it as if it is an object out there in the world that could be lifted, picked up, and then owned. And by the way, if some of you will consider here, we're considering here an escape by using Platonism, forget about it. It's not going to work. Okay, so even, when, and I promise I'm not going into that debate, but even if Plato was right, and facts and other ideas are just entities in the world floating in the heaven of pure concepts. Human knowledge of those facts are still produced by humans, right? So we can stay completely neutral on Plato and still see the problem with the argument that owning facts means just lifting something from the world, either the real world or the heaven of ideas, platonic heaven, our world. And again, the argument of lifting facts only works because of the quasi-physicalist assumption, and that assumption has been with us ever since people started arguing for copyright or property rights in facts. Things like, as you can imagine, uh, the product of scientific research or news, right? Ever since people started arguing for it, their, their response has almost always been no, you cannot lift something out of the world and own it. And again, I tried to show you that this is a quasi-physicalist fallacy. And finally, with the AI and training copies, we see a different variant. Here, the variant is about physicalism in use, right? It is the assumption that certain actions of people, certain uses of physical objects in and of themselves are relevant for copyright. Well, copyright is really about the use of the immaterial object, specifically expression. Again, just using physical objects in and of itself is only relevant when it triggers some access to or some use of expression. So three kinds of physical. Next set of questions. Why wouldn't the ghost of physicalism depart? Why are we being hunted this way? Why do we keep doing this? And what is wrong with that anyway, as I've been implying? The short answer, to use little words, are reification and fetishism. I hope you can endure little words at this stage of the evening. But let me explain what I mean by that. 
In a skating criticism of the, anal the legal analysis of computer RAM copies, as a, you know, the one, one of the contexts are listed by did not explain, Professor Jessica Littman speaks of the phenomenon of fetishizing the copy. And indeed, I think she was more right than perhaps she intended or imagined. Because physicalism in IP involves two conceptual moves. One is rarefication, the other is fetishizing. So let me explain what, what I mean by those big words. Rarefication is simply a conceptual process in which we reduce what are really social relations. In social relations, I mean relations between people. All legal rights are relations between people. We reduce them into either objects in the world or relations between people and objects. That's what it means to reaffirm. Again, misconception of a social relation between people as a relation either as an object or as a relation between a person and a thing. And what's to fetishize? What's fetishization? Well, that's the additional move of taking objects in the world and then ascribing to them powers, which are really human powers, projecting on those objects powers and abilities to influence certain things in the world, powers that they do not have. The classic example is, of course, the classic example in philosophy is Feuerbach, fetishization of the, well, the fetish, the idols, right? The physical idols to whom we ascribe powers. And the other, probably even more famous example is Karl Marx's fetishization of commodities, which has the exact same dynamic. What does that have to do in prop with property? Well, property has always been entangled with those two moves. And now I'm talking not necessarily about intellectual property, I'm talking about physical property, good old traditional physical property. Ever since it existed, I think, it's been rife with those confusions, taking what is really an interpersonal relation. So my property in my bag over there, which you cannot see, is not a relation between me and the bag. It's a relation between me and all of you with respect to the bag. It's a legal and social relation. The reification part in property is misconstruing that relation as a relation between me and the bag, a relation between a person and a thing. And then the further move is ascribing all sorts of power to that relation, assuming that, that once that relation exists, all kinds of legal conclusions follow from it. Again, that has been forever the case with general property. The classic example, and here I'll get in trouble again, I suppose, with some people, is the deep and persistent but wrong idea that the heart and essential mark of property is exclusive possession. It is just wrong. Exclusive possession is a person-thing relation. Property is interpersonal relation. Or, if you wanted to get a little bit more scholarly, consider the two most important articles ever in American property law, which is the articles by Wesley Newcomb Hoff from the early 20th century, in which he basically revolutionized the American concept of what's property forever. And it's actually the, 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 the two articles, I'm not sure I, I recommend them, if you're not in this, so they're very dry and hard. They're brilliant, but very dry and hard to read. But what you find, if you actually do read them, is that Hoffel, for reasons that are not immediately apparent, he spends pages upon pages upon pages refuting what he sees the, as the fallacy of thinking that rights in REM, property rights, are relations between a person and a thing. That's his basic point. That's his most basic move in that piece. So the phenomenon, again, has been around forever in property in general. Here is the bitter irony. Intellectual property was supposed to be the turning point. It was supposed to be the remedy for it all. Why? Because seeing intellectual property, experiencing it, should have weaned us of this tendency to reify and fetishize. 
So let me quote again, this time from actually a brilliant work in legal history, the work of Professor Morton Horowitz, which is called The Transformation of American Law. I do recommend this one if you haven't read it, really, The Transformation of American Law. If you have to choose, read the second one. There are two books. But anyway, this is what Horowitz tells us. But how could the physicalist definition of property incorporate new abstract and intangible forms of wealth, such as business goodwill or copyright and patent rights? He's writing about the late 19th century, early 20th century. During the course of the 19th century, there was a consistent tendency toward generali generalizing and abstraction of the idea of property in order to accommodate these new and intangible interests. And as the abstraction of the legal idea of property reached its culmination, it became more and more vulnerable to certain fundamental contradiction that the earlier, more modest physicalist understanding of property had been able to conceal or suppress. In other words, what Howitz is saying, the rise of intangible objects of property, like in copyright and in patents and like goodwill, because the object was intangible, made it so much hard to go on with the deception that property is really about physical connections to anything. And because of that, intellectual property in this story actually challenged the concept of property in general. It became impossible to maintain the idea that property is about physical relations to physical objects. What is property then, if, if we have to let go of that idea? Well, instead of a natural relation, sort of something that could be determined by reference to empirical facts in the world, right? Physical connection. Property turns out to be always, in both tangible and intangible property, a field of purpose, what are we trying to achieve with respect to this interpersonal relation? Because we are the one who is shaping that relation, not the connection between me and my back. What are the normative values we're trying to promote here? And perhaps most importantly, what are the right institutional forms in order to achieve what we are trying to achieve? Once we're deprived of the physical fallacy, we're deprived of the reference to nature or to empirical facts that then give us the answer. That is not available anymore. And then we have to supply our own answers about purposes, about normative values, about competing institutional designs for property or intellectual property. So again, that was supposed to be the big edifying effect of the rise of intellectual property. It turns out that the urge to physicalize the forces of reification and fetishization are stronger than we assumed, and at least partially they conquer even intellectual property. Okay, I won't detain you for much longer, but let me try to complete the argument. What happens once, as I keep claiming we should do, we let go of physicalism and go beyond it? What happens once... We put that idea aside, the idea of some legal necessity dictated by an empirical natural relation in the world. Well, now, inevitably, to have any justification for anything, we have to talk about purposes, values, and institutional designs. So very quickly, consider Myriad. Remember the patent gene case? We have to supply some reason why some sort of subject matter is patentable and the other is not. I'll be happy to hear la later your ideas on the matter. Mine are again drawn from Professor Syed. Very quickly I'll state them. They're based on a distinction between basic knowledge and applied knowledge. If you will, knowing that something and knowing how to do something. Basic science versus applied technology, if you will. And once we have that idea, we can start thinking about competing institutional frameworks of how we want to support and cultivate those different kinds of knowledge. And it's not necessarily the case that, you know, property rights are always good. 
for the latter, but it is the case that those kinds of knowledge, basic versus applied, have different features. And those v different features lend themselves differently to different kinds of basically governmental support of innovation. Applied knowledge lends itself usually much better, again, although I'm not arguing that that's always the best solution, for property rights and the signals of markets through prices. Basic scientific knowledge lends itself, for various reasons I'm not going into right now, for support through, well, how else can we support the making of knowledge? We're standing in one place that supports the making of knowledge, right? The university system, grant system, under the important process of peer review. Those two kinds of knowledge lend themselves differently to those different kinds of institutional support. And as I said, if you have something better, I'm all ears. The point is we have to offer some substantive account. And if you go with my substantive account, the one I've just suggested to you, now we can see that DNA and cDNA sequences are equally forms of basic knowledge about the world. Knowing that, basic science rather than applied technology, and therefore they both should be equally unpatentable. On the other hand, taking that knowledge and applying it to some specific method of screening for cancer, for example, that is very likely to be applied. Not necessarily patentable. There are other questions in patent law, like what is called non-obviousness in the U.S. or inventive step or novelty. But yes, patentable subject. So that's what happens. We have to ask those questions. And then we ask to, uh, have to ask questions about competing institutional framework, like property rights and the market and price signals versus university and public support and peer review. What happens with questions about facts, like in Feist? Again, the same thing. We have to supply some substantive reason why facts should not be protected by copyright. And I think once we ask the question, the reason should fairly quickly will suggest themselves to. We don't want facts to be copyrighted because, first of all, again, reasons that go to the innovation process. Facts function a lot like platforms or infrastructures. They're necessary in order to produce more knowledge and more expression, and therefore it's quite problematic to propertize them. So that's one set of issues. And the other set of issues, maybe even more obvious, there are good normative reasons why we have an aversion to propertize in facts, right? Reasons which are about values of democratic societies, about freedom of expression and freedom of thought and the shape of a public sphere. And remember, again, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some sort of an institutional support for producing facts. Indeed, once we begin to think in those terms, we might want to ask ourselves, say, in the news context, what has been the institutional support for a newspaper for a century and a half? If you ask yourself that question, you'll see that it had very little to do with property rights. And then, once we see that, we can ask ourselves, why is that institutional model collapsing right now with all sorts of very bad effects? And then we might be able to ask ourselves, what should we do about it then? And then it's far from clear that any property rights will be effective about it. Okay. I'll conclude in a moment. Um, finally, how about AI? What happens once we put the physicalist fallacy aside there? I think, to state it very quickly, I'll be happy to speak about it more later. Once we do that in the AI context, once we move beyond the copy is a copy is a copy, what we are able to see is that, indeed, there are very deep and troubling policy questions, social and cultural policy questions related to the rise of generative AI in the field of culture and expression. Okay, there are questions. At the end, all of those questions are traceable to the concern of machines displacing humans from markets for creating expression. Those are concerns about, well, you know the story by now. Loss of jobs, loss of livelihoods. In this particular area, concerns about losing opportunities for the inherent value of creative activity 
by humans, jobs and market value aside. Those are concerns about losing the sources of paradigm break in sources of innovation. AI is very good in this context in creating high quality stuff within patterns. What will break the patterns though? What will give us the next dada or new scene? And finally, concerns about platforms, right? Concentration of economic, social, and political power. The point is again, that first of all, we have to get to those substantive issues. And once we do, for reasons I won't burden you with right now, I think we'll be able to see that copyright or property rights are very ill-suited to deal with those real and troubling issues. Basically, well, I'll have to take much more time to explain, and I won't. You cannot use tools which are tailored for a particular kind of information or goods expression for a particular problem with it, the fact that it's much cheaper to copy than to create, and are based on the market, because property rights are based on the market, and apply to a very different context, where the relevant information goods that drive the dynamics is actually the meta-information, where the problem is not the difference between the cost of creating and copying, but rather the cost efficiency of AI in creating something new, and where all the concerns, if they are to be taken seriously, are extra market concerns. You have to go outside the market and look at extra market purposes if you care about those things. Okay, to conclude, and this time I will really conclude, as you've seen, we do have great challenges in store for us in intellectual property and information policies in general. We have to figure out how to deal with the challenges of the rise in AI, in culture, and way beyond it. We have to confront the ongoing challenges of genetic innovation, and we have to manage uh, the specter of a decaying and corrupted public sphere awash with misinformation, fragmentation, and polarization. Some of the answers for these questions may be with intellectual property rights. I suspect that once we put physicalism aside, maybe I'm quite sure there will not be in those realms. So to conclude, I think it is time to fully put physicalism to rest and ask the real question we should be asking about in information policy. Thank you very much. Okay.